Hello, my name is Andrew Beasley and this is Light From Above. We want to thank you for, for tuning in today. Uh, if you would like to follow along with your text uh, and your Bibles as we, as we go through this lesson, uh, the sermon will be taken from Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. I heard a story once of, of, a, of a man who loved old books. He had met an acquaintance who had just, uh, he had just gone through his attic of his ancestral home and gotten rid of many old books that, he, uh, that he, his family had, had possessed. Uh, and speaking of one book, he told this old book lover, I just couldn't read it, uh, the friend explained. Somebody named Guten something uh, had printed it. And now this old, this old book lover was astonished, and he said, Surely you couldn't mean Gutenberg. Gutenberg, uh, that Bible that you had, is one of the oldest and one of the first that was ever printed. Uh, I saw on eBay once that uh, one recently went for around $2 million. Uh, and this, this man who had gotten rid of his books from his old ancestral home said, Well, mine, mine couldn't have been worth anything some guy named Luther had scribbled over it in German. It's an interesting thing in this world how we place value upon different objects, on, on things like Bibles printed hundreds of years ago, on, on various things in our lives. The true value of things usually rests in the eye of the beholder. But we have one man, one person, one God who has proven his surpassing worth. We understand that the value of Christ Jesus does not change, regardless of the ones beholding him. Through the passage in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, we can take three key points. We see Paul discussing the meaninglessness of materialistic things. We then see him discuss the value of Jesus Christ, and finally we see how knowing Jesus Christ makes us valuable as well. In the verses leading up to verses 7 through 11, we see that Paul had been blessed wonderfully as a Jew, at least in a physical nature. We understand that. We see in, ver in verses 4 through 6 that Paul had followed the Old Testament law to a T. We, we recognize he writes that he had been circumcised on the eighth day, he tells us that he was, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. Many of the tribes at that time from the Old Testament, uh, the people of that day, didn't know what tribe they came from. They had no idea anymore. Their bloodlines, their ancestry, their lineages had become so convoluted and muddied that most people weren't able to identify whether they were from the tribe of Judah or Benjamin or any other tribe, but Paul was able to, and that would be impressive to those at that time. Beyond that, Paul tells us that he was a Pharisee who was zealous in his persecution of the early church, which was exactly what he should have been doing if Jesus and those who were following him had actually been twisting scriptures to their own profit and benefit, which is what Paul believed that Christ and his followers were doing. According to the old law, when Paul persecuted that church, or persecuted the church, he was righteous and blameless. It's what he should have been doing. All that he had done to harm the church in the first century, which is well documented in Acts chapter 7 and 8, he did so with a clear conscience. He thought he was doing what was right. He was very well thought of for the things that he did. Among his peers, he was highly thought of because of the education that he had received sitting at the feet of a man named Gamaliel. Gamaliel at the time, would have, or having an education from Gamaliel at the time, would be like having a Harvard education today. It was very well thought of, very highly respected. And yet when Paul came to a knowledge of who Jesus Christ was, he realized how meaningless all of those things that he lists and he tells us about truly were. All of it was a loss, he said. Everything he had gained by being a prominent and zealous member of Jewish society was worthless. 
Many others at the time had heard the same teachings. They knew of Jesus Christ and his life before he was crucified. Members of the Sanhedrin knew. And even though they knew, they would not profess that publicly because they were afraid of what their peers and colleagues might think. But Paul was different. Paul, when he came to a knowledge of the truth, recognized that all of the materialistic things that he had, all of the adulation, adoration, and admiration that he had was nothing. He counted it as a loss for the sake of Christ Jesus. What a wonderful, wonderful attitude. Paul recognized what we must recognize today, that you can serve materialistic things. You can make them the focus of your life, but it's to the detriment of your own soul and the souls of those, around, of those who are around you. Imagine the example it sets when a Christian or somebody who's professing to be a Christian goes out and lives in a worldly manner. It doesn't do very good things for the cause or the reputation of Christ or those who are following him. On the other hand, a person who is doing what they should, who is willing to, to sacrifice everything for the cause of Christ, well, imagine the example that that sets. Jesus taught during his ministry that one must be willing to deny himself and then take up his cross and follow him. Matthew 16, verse 24. The account of the rich young ruler describes a man who had done everything pretty well according to Old Testament law. He had followed the Ten Commandments, and yet when he came to Christ asking what he needed to do to better serve him, to, to assure himself of his salvation, Jesus tells this rich young ruler, go and sell all of your belongings. Give them to the poor. Get rid of those materialistic things in order to obtain salvation and do good works for Christ. Consider the apostles who all left their families and their loved ones and their jobs behind just to follow Jesus, to learn from him, and to do good in his name. We're blessed in so many different ways every day in our lives, and yet we must be willing to count all of those blessings as loss, to give all of those things up for the sake of Jesus Christ, because at the end of the day, all of those materialistic things, all of those good blessings, well, they'll melt with fervent heat. And it is only Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed for us on the cross that can save us from eternal doom. We see just how meaningless materialistic things truly are through the writings of Paul in this passage. We also see Paul telling us that Jesus is surpassing in worth. He's identifying the value of Christ Jesus. We understand that Jesus is worth losing everything for for many reasons. One of those reasons is the fact that he gave himself up. He came down from heaven. Imagine that. Imagine giving up the glory of heaven when you're someone like Christ to Philippians 2 verse 6 tells us that Jesus did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He was equal with God the Father in heaven, and yet he gave all of that up to come down here to this world and live amongst people like you and I and to go through many of the same struggles that we went through and we go through every day. He's worth losing everything for. He's worth counting it all as loss for that reason, as well as because of the fact that he came to this earth and lived life perfectly, without sin, something that none of us have ever been able to do. But he didn't do so easily. The Hebrew writer describes Jesus Christ as a great high priest who is sympathetic to the struggles that we go through. He's sympathetic because in his life he was tempted in all facets. That's what the Hebrew writer tells us. He understands what it's like to be tempted to have Satan knocking on the door, trying to drag him away, just like he does to you and I. We know the account of Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus is tempted by Satan three separate occasions. Imagine how difficult it would have been to resist that temptation 
when you fasted for 40 days in the wilderness and Satan comes to you and says, Jesus, turn this stone into bread. Imagine the hunger Christ would have felt and how easy it would have been for a man like him who could perform so many miraculous things. Imagine how easy it would have been for him to turn that stone into bread and to satisfy the hunger he felt, but he didn't. He resisted that temptation, but he's worth giving up everything for because he understands our struggles. He understands what we go through every day. We also recognize that Jesus is worth losing everything for because he is the innocent and spotless lamb who was sacrificed on our behalf. Imagine that. Imagine that, a man who is willing to give up his life not only for those who love him and who follow him, but for those who spat upon him, who beat him with a rod and with a whip, who pressed a crown of thorns down upon his head, who forced him to carry his cross up the hill to Mount Calvary and then drove nails through his flesh, leaving him there to suffer and die. He sacrificed his life for them too and for you and I. What a wonderful man who is worth losing everything for. Those are just a few of the reasons we recognize that Jesus is worth losing everything for, worth counting it all as loss. It's for those reasons that Paul was willing to count everything he gained, everything he had as if as nothing, if it meant that he could simply know Jesus Christ. It's for this very same reason that Paul was willing to endure all of the struggles and the trials that he went through and that he describes in 2 Corinthians 11. Being beaten on five separate occasions according to Jewish law, 40 times minus one, 40 lashes minus one. Being lost in the sea, enduring the daily struggle and trial and everything that he had to suffer for Christ's sake. He was willing to do so because Christ was worth losing everything that he had for. And it's for this very reason that James exhorts us to consider it joy when we fall into various trials and tribulations, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. But the testing of our faith in whom? Well, the answer to that is simple. It's our faith in God, our faith in Christ Jesus the one who Paul describes as being surpassing in value. We see his value through the reasons why he is worth losing everything for, but we also see his value in the fact that true righteousness comes through him. Paul recognized that in spite of being able to keep the old law as well as he did, that Levitical law, that that Levitical law did not free him from sin instead that old law it condemned man for and by his sins righteousness is not something that we can obtain on our own it's not something that we can do by ourselves there's certainly an element of that there But there is another part of righteousness that Paul describes here in this passage. The true righteousness is only found through faith in Christ Jesus. We understand that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. No one, especially not God, is expecting you or anyone in this world to have blind faith in Him. No one is expecting you to live perfectly or to know how to live rightly or even to choose to do so without evidence, without a reason why. They're not expecting you to do so just because I tell you to or some other passerby on the street tells you to. True righteousness comes through Christ Jesus and the evidence that is there that shows us everything that he had done for us. Paul devoted his life to serving Christ because of what he saw on Damascus Road. None of us will ever have that same kind of experience that Paul had, but we have something that Paul did not. We have the Holy Bible, God's completed 
revealed an inspired word, something that Paul did not have. We have all the evidence in the world that we need wrapped up in a nice book that does not contradict itself, where everything harmonizes perfectly and all the evidence that we need for Christ Jesus is there. Righteousness is dependent upon having faith in Him. How could we possibly be righteous if we do not have faith in Christ Jesus and in God the Father? We see the value of Christ Jesus through the reasons why He is worth giving up everything for and for the fact that He provides true righteousness. And through that, we understand that knowing the value of Christ Jesus leads us to be valuable too. We know him through the works that he did. Paul tells us uh, of two different events that caused him to desire to know Christ through the power of his resurrection and through his suffering. There's undeniable power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No one else has ever done what Jesus did. No one else ever died, rested for three days, and then came back and conquered death, walking again in the physical flesh. No one else has ever done that. In the same manner, no one else has ever suffered like Christ has, and like Christ did. There are those who have suffered brutal and cruel, excruciating violence for a long period of time, but how many have done so willingly like Jesus did? Aside from and maybe including the miracles of Christ Jesus, the two most striking points and marks of his ministry are his suffering and his resurrection and paul desired to know him because of those things but he did not only want to know him because of those things he went to the extent of wanting to share in the sufferings of christ jesus as we noticed in second corinthians earlier paul certainly had plenty of opportunities to suffer on the behalf of christ By sharing and suffering like Christ had, Paul was able to become like Christ in death. Not that he was nailed to a cross and crucified, but then that he was able to become submissive to the will of the Father, just as Christ had and had to have done when he was nailed to the cross and suffered on our behalf. That's the purpose of, of Christian suffering. That's how we become valuable Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Paul even describes it in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, as certainty saying that indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We have to share in the sufferings of Christ Jesus. But that that suffering is not without purpose. Paul mentioned coming to a knowledge of Christ and his sufferings and sharing in them for for the purpose of knowing Christ Jesus. But he also mentions one more reason, that he might attain the resurrection from the dead, just as Jesus did. By any means possible, Paul desired to attain the resurrection from the dead. He was willing to go to any length necessary. He was willing to go to any length necessary to ensure that at the end of time, he would be among those who would be resurrected to live eternally in heaven whatever persecution he had to endure whatever he had to sacrifice to ensure that that would happen he was willing to endure it and to sacrifice it the very meaning of what paul meant when he said that he counted it all as loss for the sake of christ And because of the surpassing value of Christ Jesus, it's revealed to us here. Knowing Christ, having faith in Him, living righteously and sharing His sufferings makes us more, more valuable than any amount of money ever could. 
It makes us more valuable than we could ever possibly hope to be on our own. Jesus told his apostles, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Loving him, having faith in him, living righteously and sharing in his sufferings leads us on a path to salvation that we can obtain through baptism. We we become valuable by becoming part of the bride of Christ which He sacrificed Himself for, that He might sanctify and cleanse her so that when she is presented to Him, she, the body of Christ, who we are added to when we are baptized, might be presented to Him spotless and pure. My friends, that is how we become valuable like Christ, by being part of the body that will be presented to Him and will live with Him in heaven eternally. What wonderful, superior, surpassing value that Christ Jesus has and what wondrous ability He has provided us to become valuable just like Him. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. Thank you.